a general question. Okay. Like taking your study sheet, like uh -huh. I've just been filling it out to my the best of my ability. Okay. And then using that, like trying to condense it all into like two sheets, and then okay. using that as a as a cheat sheet. Yeah. Do you okay. think that would be the best? Way yeah. Maybe? So so what? Because I like I'm going through the topics, and then what? I've watched all of your uh, class yeah, recordings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and then yeah. trying to skim through the articles as well. Yeah. So so I would say first priority, the biggest thing that could be, I think the, the most useful thing, is slides. And lecture. Yeah. That is that is the core of what I do. Um, again, like on last exam, many of the questions came directly off the slides, like images and pictures and stuff like that. I, I try to do that. They'll try to be the one, the, the sort of the easy ones. So like, I think slides and recordings and you know making sure you understand the lectures mm -hmm. is going to get you easily seventy five percent of the way there. Um, then I would say, um, yeah. So so your strategy of going through the sheet. So essentially when I created the sheet, I went through the slides and the readings and sort of pulled out things that I thought were sort of key, key ideas. And so, I mean, if you, you can go through my sheet basically in order and it will track you through the slides and lectures and you can sort of answer those things that are in order. Yeah. yeah I think that would be probably the smartest way to go, yeah. Okay, perfect. I yeah. think what I'm struggling with though is like the level of detail. Cause like that's what I did for the last midterm. And I literally copied like the slides onto my cheat sheet and it like obviously didn't help me. So I think I'm struggling with, like, I, I think in, in my mind, I'm expecting to have, like, conceptual type of questions based on what we're asked versus, like, it seemed like the last midterm, it was like, can you remember what equation was on this particular slide? I don't think I asked you a single equation question. There was that one about the elasticity with the keyword, like the log formula. Okay, so, okay, I asked you one equation one. Okay. So, so that's what I'm struggling with. I'm like, all these equations, it's like, do I need to understand the concept or do so, I need to remember so, the so equation? You, so, but you use the exam, use that exam as, as your baseline, right? So of the 31 questions, you had one that included an equation. The other so ones what, essentially... So what one equation of the, like, hundreds of equations that are on the slides that we're seeing do I need to remember? <laughs> so, so, so... Because there's only 30 questions, right? So if you miss that one, it's... Uh, a big chunk of your grade so so I wouldn't take it as let me find the one equation that I may need to remember I would take it as my so so the exam is not constructed so the exam is constructed such that most of the questions are conceptual and intuitive and they essentially um, will test if you pay attention in class if you understand the concepts if you've done the reading if you, if, you know, if, if it's not just sort of I have a vague idea, but I have like sort of a, again, not a deep theoretical, but a deep intuition about the idea. Um, so, and so, and so, yes, yeah, so it is possible. I mean, I won't say a class about data science won't involve equations, right? That would be like the antithesis of data science in itself. But I wouldn't take it as, let me figure out which equation I need to memorize. The, the, the question, because even without remembering the equation, the question itself could be sort of, you know, could, if you understand conceptually what it's doing about transforming variables, you could derive that in your head as well. So I think, and I know we're getting off topic right now, but okay. I think it, it gets difficult because we have homework assignments that are in R, yes. and then we have, you know, the lectures, and we have yep. the slides, yep. and then we have readings, and they, yep. it's hard to kind of tie them all together sometimes and understand, like, what we're actually truly going to be tested on. Like, we can only be asked 30 questions, and there's so much material, and, like, so, so again, I, 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 I think the, I think the, if the really focus difficult. is on how do I best memorize or write down what I need to pass the exam, that's always going to be the worst strategy. I think that you, you should not be optimizing to the exam be optimizing to the but the way the exam asks questions almost like forces you to do that and i know we're getting off topic okay but yes. like it and i know i want to talk to you about the last exam too okay but it the way the exam is written is not really so that you can kind of synthesize information it's like very particular like specific questions about like a slide or like something that was mentioned or like so, so, okay. so it's hard to so, know like what we should be focusing I'll on i'll respond to that so and then i'll try to i mean i assume people want actually the answers to Get to get the questions, and so I'll, I'll try not to waste the time. Not waste. Try not to exhaust the time on sort of a maybe a personal dialogue that we could have off topic, offline. Um, but sort of in, in, in finality, I would say that um, every concept we cover has a tremendous amount of detail to it, like precise information and detail. Um, and I think that um, the synthesis of information is something that that owns. I, I sort of have to put upon your shoulders because I could spend a entire 
week of lectures just synthesizing sort of the, the thread between things. And I try to, you remember, I always try to, even with the stat class, sort of where we came from to how we got here. I try to create that thread for you sort of in a generic sense, but um, that essentially is the goal of the class, like is that I'm going to present information to you. You're going to have to try to digest it. And I try to give you very grounded examples in class, uh, examples of the slides, homeworks, whatever, to sort of solidify that. But the thread um, is sort of, you know, the, the task, that, that task is sort of, sort of for you guys. Um, and then obviously that can be a conversation. It doesn't be sort of uniformly on your side. It can be like, here's what I think. Can I get, can I get sort of some validation on that? Um, but um, again, like, so there are details about the methods and yes, you should understand the details, but I don't, again, I, the, 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 I'm giving you multiple choice questions. I'm giving you true or false. I, you have a couple of sort of short answer where you can actually explain or detail. And so um, I, I have to ask questions. Um, you know, I remember the one good example, I think, and I'll stop there, is like the, the clustering war where it was a density-based cluster. And I said, basically, can two points be in the same cluster if they are, um, if they are density, density, the basically not density reaching from each other, right? And that was sort of relied upon the fact that you understood conceptually that density reachability and density connectivity are two different concepts that sort of connect to each other, but that's what allows things to be grouped together or not. Like that, that is not a, it's a mathematical concept, but I don't require you to tell me what density reachability is explicitly or connectivity is explicitly. Simply, can you recall that that is what derives group, cl group clustering, not in your head, not just connected, connectability. So that, that's the way I would pose it. And again, we can, we can certainly, you know, have this dialogue sort of going forward, you know, for exam one, exam two, but let me try to get to the questions you guys have so that at least we can get that out of the way. So I'll let you guys sort of throw out questions and I'll address them as they sure. come. I'm just compiling what Sandy had so we can okay. go in now. So you want to throw one at me now so we can start? Yeah. Little, um, about 20 minutes in already. Yep. Uh, so the first question I had was on topic modeling. Okay. Where the section where it says, where, what does it assume? Um, what I had this? was, mm -hmm. we assume that topics are specified before any data has been generated. But I don't so know what we, that means. Okay, so so when I say I can't, re I can't repeat what I said, too. Okay, you want to repeat it? Yeah, okay, um, we assume that topics are specified before any data has been generated. Right. So 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 the assumptions you think about with topic modeling is that it essentially creates a data generating process, which is represented by that graphical model, right? And we walk through that process of what it, how it believes documents are generated. Um, you know, essentially it assumes there is a finite set of topics, as you sort of pointed out, those topics and what, what is a finite set of topics? It's really a probability distribution over words, right? So one, each one of those topics, so the topic of, you know, sports is essentially, you know, 10% about the word bat, 5% about the word ball, 3% about the word field, 2% about the word whatever. And so it's a distribution over essentially all the words, right? So are you, as like when you're starting this process, you're like randomly choosing topics, right? Or like where, where do the topics come so, from? So you have, to, you have to disentangle two things, right? And so, and so a lot of what happens in probabilistic modeling, which is a non-trivial component of, of, you know, modeling in data science, is that there is a presumed data generating process. That is to say that I believe the way that something was constructed or something is generated follows this particular pattern, right? That's what you assume. And then you say, now all I observe is the actual data point that I assume were generated by that process. And so then I wanna estimate the parameters of that process. So let me give you an example. I assume that a bag of Skittles, one of M&Ms that I get when I get them, has, is generated by some machine which produces particular colorings of, of the red and blue and green ones and depending on the package size and things like that. I assume that's the way. And again, we kind of know that because we know that that's what, how machines work. But there's some process that generates my bag of M&Ms. I have no idea. So I'm going to assume it's basically a machine that, that does this, does this, does this, does this, and does this. And I get a bag of M&Ms out. I don't know what the parameters for that machine is. I have no idea. And so all I'm collecting is my packages of M&Ms. And so... So in this example, are the M&Ms the words or like the topics? Yes. yes. Okay. So, 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 okay, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me put this on to directly onto the context of the topic modeling. The word, the documents themselves are the MMs, or the things that we get back. All we get are the documents. I assume that, I, specifically what we assume in topic modeling is that my document is generated 
from a process which starts off with a finite set of topics. So I have, let's say, 10 topics. And then I believe that basically what happens is that from those topics, I, in order to generate the word in a document, I pick a topic, sorry, I pick a document, and then I essentially, from the, from the topic, from the distribution of topics for a document, so a document is composed of 50% about sports, 50% about- But how do, you, how do you get to that point? So when you say, how do you get to that point, what do you so mean? So you have a document, how do you get to the point that you know 50% is sports, 50% is- so, 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 so- Is that just something you're assuming going in? So, so you don't, you assume that it's composed of some combination of topics. And you don't know what that combination of topics is. You don't know what purport, you don't know what proportion of each topic belongs to a document, right? So you are a person. You are let's think about let's think about your 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 uh, your particular genetic heritage, right? You are twenty five percent I don't know Irish or five percent something whatever, right? Yeah, Mexican, yeah, sure, <laughs> something like that, right? And I don't we don't know, right? And so you're saying like, how do we get to that point? Well, I'm assuming that because I know how genetics works that you are composed of that. I don't know what it is, but I'm composed of that. And then I can look at your, let's say, look at your DNA or look at your features. And I say, well, your eyes look like this, your hair is this color. I'm then going to say, well, based on what I know about everyone else and their features, I'm potentially saying that you must be about 5% this and 25% that. And are the features the topics? The features in her, the features I'm looking at are the documents. Documents. Okay. Right? Those are the, those are the things I, so the, top, the words, i.e. the documents, which are collections of words, are the only things I observe. Mm -hmm. I only observe the documents. Mm -hmm. And the question is... By looking at across like, lots of documents, I'll find shared topics, right? I'll find shared words that go together and me have some semantic meaning to them. If I see a bunch of things that whenever they mention the word bat, they also mention the word ball. Mm -hmm. and, when, and they topically, typically also use the word field and team. Then there is some, some inherent meaning tied to those words that they're similar. Now, again, we impose on top of that, that means sports. But the algorithm just knows that these words tend to co-occur. They have some they have some semantic sort of connection with each other, and so we're going to say this thing talks a lot about words that tend to go with these other words, and we say means sports. So again, we only observe the, the way it works. And again, the model I showed in the slides, I sort of tell you, you know, the the thing I put in gray is the words. Those are the only things we observe. We assume the words are created by this structure that we put on top of it. That's assumption. So that structure is one of the assumptions. That structure assumes also a finite number of parameters, as you mentioned, Andrew. Um, it, uh, and it assumes this is how you generate words. It believes that essentially you first go, and I can pull, let me actually pull the slide up to get you yeah. guys so can I, can well. I walk through my understanding and see if it's right? Um, uh, yeah, sure. That would be great. That, that's fine. Yeah. This is, a, this, I mean, again, this is all for you guys. It's not me lecturing. It's about no. whatever works for you. So all so for your. My understanding is you have documents and, and words that you observe. Yes. You set a K, which you think, you say, I think this document is has K number of topics. Sure. You look at the words, pull a word at random, and, and see whether it actually lines up with the topics Isn't that you assume. So, 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 yes. Yeah. So, so, kind of a mixture of what you guys just said. So, you're right. You, you, you have a fixed set of topics. You have a document. And what you say is, listen, I believe that the way the document is generated was that um, this document document has a fixed distribution over topics. That means that this document is going to be 20% about this topic, 30% about this topic, 50% about this topic. Again, that's what you assume. And you don't know those topics. That you're just saying... Exactly. You're just assuming the distribution. Of yes. Them. And so to be ex ex exact, actually, is that it's a, it's a distribution over all the topics. It's just that some topics will have close to zero probability. So it's not that you literally have three these three topics and that's it. It's the other ones have 0.0000% probability of actually occurring. Right, so you have a document, so let's do this, right? You have, you have a document, which is, you know, 25% T1, 50% T2, uh, let's say 24.9% T3, and then 0.1% all the other T4 through T20, right? So I believe that for a document, it's, it's generated by first, it's generated, it's gonna be 20%, you know, this proportion of these topics. This t topic, so let's say to say T1, is a distribution over word. So T1 is basically word one, word two. It's you know, one percent word one, one percent word two, twenty percent word three, dot 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 dot. Let's say word one hundred, zero point zero zero one, and so forth. 
right? So that means, so this, so I believe that basically a topic is a, di a document is a distribution over topics, and a topic is a distribution over words. And so how I create my document is I first say, here's my document, and again, this is a distribution that we don't know, but let's assume we knew it. We'd say, okay, I'm gonna choose one of these topics at random. So I say, randomly choose a topic, topic two. It's the most likely, most likely topic. And then I go to topic two, and I say, give me a word. Mm, at random, that one, word three. And then the first word in, in this document is word three. Then I want another word. So then I say, okay, pick, pick a topic at random. This one, topic three. Go to topic three's word distribution. Pull a word at random from word three. This one, I mean, sorry, topic three, word seven. And that's how I generate my document. So I assume that the document I actually have observed in front of me was generated this way. And then the thing we have to get at is what are these proportions and these proportions if in fact this is how all the documents were generated. So it's like if I observe 50, if I serve you know, this many blue M&Ms in this package, this many blue M&Ms in that package, this many yellow M&Ms in that package, what is the particular parameters of the machine to give me that particular set of, of uh, M&M color distribution? Does that make sense? And so the assumption is that there's rules to how the topics and the words underneath that are generated? Yeah, so the assumption of, of, topic, to, something of LDA is as, as we sort of laid out, right? So again, I mean, I'll have to sort of, I may miss some of the, them, but in general, you assume that you have a finite set of topics. Okay. You assume that this particular graphical model is one that actually um, is how your document was actually generated. Um, Right, and so for all, the, so that that means that each topic is itself a distribution of words, um, and that each, um, sorry, each document is a distribution over topics. Uh, so to repeat that, um, the model is how the words roll up to the topics, roll up to the document. Sure. Yeah, you can say you can think about it that way as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the one of the big things that I point out in the lecture um, is that. This assumption, this, this model assumption, is kind of, it's, it's what we can do, but it's not actually how word, how documents are created, right? Because I don't, I don't basically say I want to write an article about, um, about the Red Sox, and then I, and then I say, okay, so my document is gonna be fifty percent about baseball, twenty five percent specifically about the Red Sox, and ten percent about the Yankees, and you know one percent about I don't do that, and then I say, okay, write my document, randomly choose a topic, randomly choose a word, word number one. Right? I write it with some actual cognitive understanding. And so, for example, the sequence of my words here actually matter, whereas in this context, they don't. I pull them at random. There's no semantic like A goes before B or it goes before the. It's just like random. So that's not actually how documents are created. And so that's a flaw or that is a, 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 a incorrect assumption, but it's better than nothing. And so sort of assumption-wise, understanding how the assumptions work and what they imply and how those assumptions also have flaws in them uh, is important. Okay. So, so again, I mean, so to me, like that's that's the understanding I, I would aim for. And then to take a step back, sure. LDA is 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 kind of measuring the probability of how words are associated or are built together into a document. So LDA is a particular type of topic modeling, uh -huh. and topic modeling is about um, uncovering the general themes, probably the themes are, uh, that exist across a corpus of documents. Okay. Okay. LDA specifically goes about that in a certain way, and it's this way yep. with the particular graphical model that I showed you guys, where you have the topics pulled from a deer site distribution, and you have a multinomial for the words, where you have the multinomial for like the, the distribution of uh, words per topic, and then topics in documents and so forth. So there's like a structure to it. And those parameters are based, that's the machine that generates the documents at the end. We want to estimate those parameters. And so you could think about creating another structure that could produce words and documents, M&Ms and colors, that could be different, would have different parameters. But LDA is a specific one that is very popular. And Dierschleck, or however you say it. Dierschleck distribution? Specifically yes. references the fact that you have like distributions of topics over distributions of words? Yes. So, so, the, dear, so, so the way they about this, the dear, so everything's a distribution. Right, and so the way I think about the the multinomial is specifically a um, like a like a, say like a a, a t-sided die or d-sided die, right? 
So think about like a die that has like 10 sides. And it says, okay, it's, you know, 10 per it could be equal sided die, whereas 10% of everything gets get the same, everything gets the same percentage. Equal sided die, or it could be something where Wait, one no. side is weighted one way or the other one, right? That's a die, and I, that's a distribution. I can roll that, and I get a three. I can roll that, and I get a five, right? So I'm generating data from my, my rolls. So I can have a die that is, as you said, equal. I can have a die that's weighted in some way. So a Dirichlet is the distribution I pull my die from. So my, think of my die as a random variable. It could be 50, 50, 50, or it can be 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, or it can be one half, and then like, you know, I guess nine, nine half. The other half has to be divided by nine, right? We can do things like that. And so how do I actually get the, the die? I pull the die at random from a Dirichlet, and then I put my word at random from the die. Okay. That's the process. And so the Dirichlet is what we call a prior on top of the multinomial. Um, and so that's the way to think about it. In, in the picture, um, you know, I give you the picture on, on, on slide 10, for example, on topic modeling, there's like the, like there's like the picture of the, of the document and there's like the pink and yellow and blue bars on the right hand side. Um, I can try, uh, I got it. you got it. Um, you see that yet yeah, pink and yellow and blue bars on the side, yep. right? That's a topic distribution. That's how much this document belongs to which topic, the pink or the yellow or the blue. On the left-hand side, those are the topics. The yellow is a distribution of a word. So you see the percentages for each word. And so that, that pink, yellow, and blue, I, it could be, it could have different heights. So that blue, pink, yellow, and blue right there is a multinomial. That's the idea of my multinomial, right? And then the thing that gives me that pink, yellow, blue, the heights is my deer sleigh. So I pull my graph of pink, yellow, and blue heights from a deer sleigh. And that gives me the distribution for my, you know, think about how my, my topics, uh, how my document is made up. So the, again, the die is my pink, yellow, and blue. Like the example, like how much, how, how many times I'm gonna roll a pink, how many times I'm gonna roll a yellow, how many times I'm gonna roll a blue, there's weights on that. But again, the weights could be vast, they could be different. So the, the, the actual picture here was drawn from a deer sleigh, gave me one particular set of weights, and then I used that particular set of weights to draw other things from them, draw my, throw my die. And how does that relate to a multinomial distribution? So, so we just went over, so the multinomial is that. The multinomial oh, okay. is the die. Oh, okay. So the Dirichlet is one step above. Exactly. That. The Dirichlet. You say, give me a random die. Uh huh. That's what Dirichlet gives you. Oh, and then the multinomial is the die itself. Is the die itself? Okay. And then from a die, you say, give me a random color, a random word, a random item, heads, tails, left, right. You know, the, the die gives you that. Okay. Okay. That work. Um, I think so. Okay. I think that answers Sandy's question. Okay. Good. Um. Okay. So what I have here. Um, on how are they used in LDA, the Dirichlet and the multinomial. Right, so I, I think... When you generate your document, you generate a topic proportion, which is drawn from the Dirichlet. Exactly. And the Dirichlet gives the multinomial, which is a dice, yep. where it puts more weight on one topic over the other. Yep, and, that, so that, and that's for... Now, now no, if you notice, the Dirichlet happens in two places in topic modeling. It happens, if you look at the graphical model, if you go to the same, same lecture, but yep. go to slide, um, go to slide uh, 14, you see you have a you have a Dirichlet, you have beta K on the right hand side. It says topics. Yep. And you have uh, alpha, right, that's giving you your theta D on the left hand side. Okay. So 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 this is a mathematical representation or a model representation of what we just talked about. So the beta K is your topics. So you have beta one, beta two, beta three, beta four, right? Those are your topics, those are just die. Okay, where the die, it's, it's, um, each die has a distribution over words. So the die is, let's say, 100 words, 100 sided die, yep. and it has weights on each one of those 100 sides, and those are the words. And so, beta K, so, so I'm going to basically draw my die for a given topic. So I say, topic one, this is a, this is a die over words, right? I'm good there. And then, this is, um, so, so I get that from my words, but again, my document itself is a distribution over topics, which is also a die. So, for, so let's say I have a die that's, um, let's say there's K document, K topics, I have a K-sided die, right, for each, for each document I have. So this is going to be 25% side 2, 50%, sorry, 25% side 1, 50% side 2, and so forth. That's one multinomial. 
And then for a given, that's a document, distribution over topics. And then for a topic, there's a multinomial or a die for the words. So you have two Dirichlets and therefore two multinomials. They represent two different things. Whenever you have a situation where you have a finite number of things that you want to have randomly being drawn, that to think about it, a multinomial being generated by a Dirichlet. So Inception. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Actually, someone asked that question uh, on Yellow Dig. Will asked that question on Yellow Dig, and it was like, so it's like inception of parameters. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, what else do you have? My next question's on PCA, but. Um, I had a question. Let me pull mine up. Really, the uh -huh. Bayes network. Bayes networks. Okay. But like, just the actual steps of like, create like starting from it and like creating a Bayes network and refining it? Like. So, so, so I would say that the creation of a Bayes net for your guys' purposes, again, there are people, I mean, and I, I've done work in this, so it's not that it's not useful, but for most purposes, um, if you're applying them, you're gonna just, they're gonna be created for you from like an R program. So I would say conceptually what you want to understand is what the Bayes net is capturing. I thought more, one of the things was build a Bayes network. So, so, so if you remember from lecture, I, I said that sort of this part, I sort of said this part was not sort of, I, I included it for you to actually understand and be able to go through things, but I did not, I actually explicitly said like, building one from scratch is something that I want you guys necessarily to worry about. Again, so both in the advanced anomaly detection slides and the Bayes net slides, I have like large, I have like, I don't know, maybe a handful of slides in both of those where I said sort of this is additional information for you guys. Basically, I prepared lecture and I realized that, okay, this may be a little too deep or we don't have enough time. And so I sort of say, it's there for you because I do want you to understand it, but I'm not going to explicitly test you on building it from scratch, for example. You want to build a base net from scratch. If okay. You can look at a base net and explain to me what it's capturing, what's conditionally dependent of what, how to actually compute the joint probability distribution over things from the base net. Like I have, I have an, I have an, an extra uh, additional lecture, and again, I posted this as an announcement to you guys. But Chris said he, again, he didn't also get informed about the actual, um, like from Moodle saying, hey, there's a new post, but there's a post on extra material for BayesNet that sort of explicitly says, I've given this lecture now three times, and it's gotten better every time. And so please do go back and look at the the newer version because I think it actually makes things clearer. Um, I, I watched that video. And and it still is a little confusing. Yeah, again. I've watched it twice. Today. I think probabilities, just, today. just in general, are not very intuitive for me, at least. Uh, I mean, and that, that's I mean, that's understandable. I mean, so I, I think you like you know, probabilities are going to be a huge part of so, what you do. And in, and when I and this is kind of again where I'm struggling. So I I found some other slides online okay. that I I feel like for me conceptually make things easier a little bit. Okay, but good. Then it's like, but I know you're going to ask stuff on your side, so it's like I need to understand what's there, and it's okay. just hard to. So, so if you think about if you think about my slides, the major things are: do you understand what a Bayes net is encoding? That means you looked at the if you looked at the actual Bayes net. First of all, what a Bayes net is trying to do? Like that's key number one. Yeah, it's trying to show like probability like among different yeah from different I guess parents. And then you can tell if they're related or not. Based yes. On their parent. So 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 they're, they're so so I would say the most basic thing a, a Bayesian is trying to capture is the joint probability distribution over your data. That's like step number one, okay. right? Because the the whole point of this is that if I have probability, I want to know the probability that I'll get a customer will be a male. So let's say gender equals male, and they will um, be age will be greater than you know let's say equal to thirty. And um, they will uh, click on my ad, and it will be uh, a Tuesday, so day equals Tuesday, um, you know, and whatever. I want to know that question. This and this and this and this. That's and that's represented by the joint probability of my data, right? If I said I just want to know the probability, I want the probability of getting a uh, of a certain age, right? And I said it looks like this, with a mean at let's say. 35 and I said a sigma was equal to you know one year and I asked you what's the probability of getting a certain age you can tell me you would say let me look at this but the probability of getting something between you know age 45 and 60 you would say 45 60 you would do the density from this way density this way subtract them and get the range between here like that's what you would do from stats so this lets me ask the question the probability of observing something the Bayesian is saying now, again, if I said age and something else, 
right? It'd be some kind of complex high dimensional distribution, which we haven't necessarily talked through in stats because we started with simple things, but you can imagine sort of many distributions in a high dimensional space, which is sort of over these different ages. But you have to make certain assumptions to make that work. A Bayesian is trying to capture that distribution in a high dimensional space, the probability of seeing someone get on a Monday, or I'm sorry, a male in their 30s um, who clicked on the ad on, you know, on, a, on a Wednesday, right? It's a joint probability over all my data. That's, that's, that's you know, feat number one. The, the point is, is that if I wanted to capture that joint probability distribution, I have to create this long table. So that's, let me go, let me go to the actual slides on this. Um, if you go to slide, um, you can think about like, let's see, which slide I want you to go to. Let's go to slide uh, number three, right? Is that... On Bayesian? Yeah, Bayesian is slide number three, right? Is that, yeah, I'll give you a picture here of slide number three of a, of a two-dimensional distribution of a Gaussian. So this is a one-dimensional, that's a two-dimensional, and it can grow to many dimensions. The point is, is that um, if I wanted to encode that information, I'd have to take, look, I'd look at every combination of value. I look at the probability of males, of ages, of clicks, if days in a week, and join them all together because all the different combinations uh, to get my probabilities, right? That's the, that's the challenge. And so what Bezos try to do is say, listen, I don't believe everything's dependent on everything else. I believe there's some things that are basically independent or at least conditionally dependent of other things. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reduce the number of things I must actually consider in order to make that work. So the, the lecture sort of talks about basically how I can encode information, and my graphical model can learn the encoding and represent that and say, you know what? Once I know, so let's think, let's think about this. Let's think about the, 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 the gap in pay, right? So let, let's say we know, that, we know that men and women make different amounts of money, and we know that African Americans and uh, whites make different kinds of money, right? So let's people of color and not right, make different kinds of money. But let's just say we said that that, that, get gender, that, uh, that pay gap was just about gender. That once I knew that basically if I looked at people of color who were women and people and, uh, and, um, and uh, uh, Caucasians who were women, they make the same amount of money. And uh, people of color who are men, people of color who are Caucasians, they make the same amount of money. They'll basically say that once I knew which particular uh, gender you were, it didn't matter what your, what your race was. I knew exactly how much money you were going to make, right? So if I didn't know that, I would, have to, I would have to model race, gender, and pay. But here, I just, con I, I just condition basically pay on your actual, uh, what did I say mattered? Gender. gender. Gender, and then I have enough information. So basically, I can basically get rid of, essentially trying to estimate this, I can get rid of a certain value or a conditioning set that I don't need anymore. So that's really the goal of it, is that I can actually reduce um, by, by the base that encoding conditional independence, what things are condition independent of what other things, I can actually um, do a better job at estimating the probability distribution without having to encode everything. And so if you go to the, there's an additional, um, um, what's it called, an additional sort of thing I posted up on BayesNet about inference. D the DNA one? Or there's an article that you posted. Too. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. There's a, I actually did a, a voice over, over slides. I have um, extra slides. You go to BayesNet on the Moodle site, there are two extra sets of slides. Okay. Um, one is about naive Bayes uh, and whatnot, um, and w which uh, won't appear on the exam, so that's fine. And one is about, um, and you haven't covered naive Bayes yet because you don't have a critical model, which is why it won't appear on the exam. Um, and the other one is about essentially inference with BayesNets. And like that is, I mean, that's sort of that lays out essentially what the whole goal of this is. Um, so I would highly recommend watching that video. Um, if you want to think about equations that would appear up appear on your on your exam, Bayes nets, which are probability statements, are more like are probably the most likely type of equation thing that would appear on your exam because it's the one thing that is that the probability of A get like given B or. How did you explain it in, in the report recording? It was like, if I have A, B, A, B and C, yes. A, A and B are conditionally independent given C yes. because, and then you gave an equation, it was like, probability of A comma B given C. 
is equal to. Oh, so it may it maybe this thing was so. so what, I guess what, what I said is that what we know is that if I said the pro, if I told you what's the probability of A and B, um, hopefully you remember from stats, this is going to be the probability of A given B and the probability of B. That's just the chain rule from statistics. Yep. Um, this is also equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A. Either one of those works. Um, so if I had something like what's the probability of a comma B comma C um, and I can say this is the probability uh, this equals the probability of A um, times the probability of B given A times the probability of B uh, C given A and B but if I told you that if I said that basically C is conditionally independent of A given B if I said that was the case that means that once I'm given B, C is basically independent of A, this just turns into the probability of C, um, let's see, C given A, uh, C is going to be A, sorry, B to A, C given B. Right? So, like, basically, um, having this additional information does nothing for me, right? One, so, once I know that you're, um, once I know that you are a woman, knowing your gender has no information for me to tell me what your, what your wage is going to be. Sorry. Once I know yeah. you're a woman, knowing your color, sorry, has no information about what your wage is going to be. Because once wage is, is, is dependent on, on, um, gender. on gender, not on color. And so once I, if I, if I have a condition on gender, color becomes irrelevant. That's basically what conditional dependence is saying. Okay. Okay? So it can, you can think about it this way as thinking about... If I condition on the thing that, if these two things are conditionally dependent, given something else I'm conditioning on, I can just drop that. That's equivalent to saying probability of A, let's say again, in this case it'd be C and A. So let's say C, let's say C and A given B. So the probability of C and A given B, if I told you C and A were independent, just in general, right? And I said, if I told you C and A were independent, and I ask you the probability of C and A, what would that be? So if C and A are independent, right? Probability of C times probability of A? Exactly. So if C and A are conditionally independent of B, this equals the probability of C given B and the probability of A given B. Right? So if they were just independent without anything, it would be C times A. But they're conditionally independent, which means that you just didn't have to condition each one of your marginals, C and A, on B. This means they're conditionally independent. So this statement and this statement are equivalent. And they both mean conditional independence. Is that the type of equation that we would have to know? That's not an equation you'd have to... I mean, so again, I haven't wrote the exam. I wrote, I wrote a bunch of questions. I wrote, I wrote like 60 questions or something. Uh -huh. um, maybe 50, and so I'm going to pull them together. Um, and so if you think about the kinds of things that are likely to be equation-like, those are the kinds of things that are likely to be equation-like, because these are things that are essentially, you know, so these are probability statements that I, that I would hope you guys are getting even more comfortable with, if not, you know, feel pretty comfortable with already. Yeah. Um, and so, like, it's those statements, in terms of a larger question, like, you know, base nets are not, you know, they're still learning those, but probabilities... And conditional independence and you know those kind of things are things that you know we sort of assume you have a, a found at least a foundation in already okay. and you can sort of work through those for the context of you know the harder question like a base net for example do we have to worry about arbitrary conditional independence Ar i don't know what you mean arbitrary conditional independence one of the slides says how to compute arbitrary conditional uh, sorry probabilities oh from, from the base net you mean yeah um i would say that that is something also that you. Cause those slides are kind of scary. Well, yeah. you don't want. Okay, so so you know, these are certainly things that are within the wheelhouse of things we covered in statistics. They have not been covered from a base net before, but they're just probability statements. And so, I know you guys know how to do it because we did it like a bunch of times and many of you got the questions right. I think it's just that it's from this angle it feels 
you know, scary. I um, think like, something like this, like the probability of the joint entry yeah, and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. So, so again, um, um, again, I, I try to, I try to back away from things as I explicitly know. Listen, um, I didn't cover it in the slides, and I don't want you to go over it. It's something you're gonna learn. R. I won't say it's never gonna show up because if something shows up, people are gonna go like, "You said it never show up," or "You said this thing, which is related to this thing, never gonna show up." So, I won't say it's, something's never gonna show up. Um, I would say that you can certainly do this. Um, I would say that if this is the thing, if this some, were something to show up, um, it would certainly be one of your larger like time questions. It wouldn't be like sort of like a, it would be something you and I would do my best to lay out clearly what I want you to do. Um, but what I would say is that for these kinds of things, you know, think more generally about A, B, and C, right? If I told you I want the probability of A given B, I mean A and C. A, B, and C. So here. Here I say, right. So I say I want, let's take this example. Let's take an example quick, just like the bay, bay part of this game. So probability of S. And I think I actually go through this in the recording, but J, comma, L. Right? So this is, this, I want another probability. Right? But think about this just as A. This is just A. And this is just B. Okay? And I think the Bayes net says S goes to L goes to T comes from J goes to R. Right? So the question is. From this, um, how do I compute this thing? Okay, so I just, I know from, if I said this was A and B, and I asked you what's the probability of A given B, what did we just decide that was? Probably the A times. So, so, okay, I wrote it this way. I said probability of A and B equals the probability of A given B times the probability of B. Right, this is just what we know from statistics from our, from our class last year, for example. It's called the chain rule of the problem, okay? Right, so if I have this, that means that, so, th so let me say this. This is something you should certainly know. Like, this is something like that, if you don't remember it, you should write down everything you ever do in terms of statistics. So that one and uh, probability of A union B being equal to the probability of A, what's the probability of B minus probability of A and B, if you don't remember them, that one, and then if you if you can't rederive it, Bayes rule, probability of A given B equals the probability of B given A to the probability of A over the probability of B, or like the fundamental like equations in statistics that we and probability there that we use. So like if you don't remember them, you should always have those somewhere. And after a while of writing down, you'll remember them. So. So then you should say, okay, if I, if I want the probability, so you see this here, don't get scared. Just see, I have one set given another set, right? I have A given B, that's what this really is. So if that's the case, then this has to equal then what? According to A given B, that means this has to be the probability of A and B over the probability of B. So that means, I'm going to write this out, the probability of S and, so S and T, that's A, and not J and L, so that's my numerator, divided by the probability of B, which is just the probability of not J and L. Right? So that, that's, so I mean, that should tell you, okay, now, I know the probability of S, T, J, and L. Right? And so our Bayes net um, tells us how to write this probability out. So the big key of the Bayes net is that, and again, I go through this, I go through this on the video, uh, so I'm going to go through it slightly quickly here. But if you go back to the inference video on Bayes, I walk because again, it was not until after the the even the third class, I had like a little session with someone for five minutes after class, and it made came very clear what was kind of loose. So I wrote this example out, and like five people listened and said, oh, this makes perfect sense. And so I wrote, I actually spent like an hour creating like this sort of this visual on the slide. So 
you should go click on it and watch it because it actually will make the inference of what I'm about to say about this make perfect sense if, you, if it doesn't make sense yet. But because I know the probability of A and B equals the probability, so let me actually write it this way. A. Where, uh, where's that example? If, if you go to the Moodle and then uh -huh. go to the BayesNet, um, the BayesNet section on the Moodle, yep. there's like two extra slides or whatever I say, like extra BayesNet slides or whatever. Yep. Yep. The one on inference is the one I'm referring to here. Because when it says, I think he says like BayesNet inference or something. Uh, I guess Did you say recording. extra? Yeah, so if you, do you mind my, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you go to Moodle, can you, can you go to, oh yeah, this one, and then it's inference, exactly, this thing. And so there's actually a recording as well, so I give you a link to also. Yeah, that's the one I watched. Uh, this one, this is the one you yeah. watched. Okay, so this is what I'm about to go over. So maybe, so at least, at least now maybe you have the, the background on what I'm trying to say here. So if I say A and B and C, right? Again, so let me, let's, let's revisit what we just said to get it pushed into your brain. If I do the probability of A and B, what is this equal to? Probability of A times probability of B. So if they're independent, what if they're not independent? Just generally speaking, what is what is it equal to? Uh, probably of A given B. Uh huh. Times probability, probability of B. Yes. It also equal to either one. You can get it, you can addition to either one on either on either way. Actually, this is what Bayes rule. This is what actually Bayes rule is. If you remember, Bayes rule says the probability of A given B equals the probability of B given A times the probability A over the probability of B, which basically means that the probability of A given B times the probability of B equals the probability of B given A times the probability of A, which just comes from from, from statistics, I mean, from probability theory, I should say. So all, so all Bayes rule is doing is basically taking um, essentially this equality, putting it on one side, and dividing by the other one. It's actually, Bayes rule actually is, is very intuitive in that sense. But yes, so I can, I basically I can write this A and B in any order I want. A given B times B, or B given A times A. Let me, go, let me take you one step further with three variables. So, A and B and C equals probability of B given A, actually let me write, let me do it this way, probability of A times the probability of B given A and the probability of C given B and A. Right, just first A, then B given what I've already observed, which is A, and then C given what I've already observed, which is A and B. Also equal to the probability of B given C, let's say the probability of C and the probability of B given C to the probability of A given C. That also counts. I can do them in whatever order I want. A given B, then B given C and A and whatever. And so I have many different ways I can write this, pro this, this probability out, right? Just like, I have the same thing here. I have a, I have A and B and C and D. That's what I'm concerned about for this question right here. And I can write this any particular way I want. So I can write this as S and then let's say L given S and then T given L and S and then J given S, T and L. What's, what's Is the symbol it not J? I'm sorry, not, sorry, not J. Okay. Thank you. That's not J. So it's, because in this case not we're thinking about things J. being binary. So either it's Oh, true or false, so true or not true, which is false. Um, yes, yeah, so that means not. That, that's right, Christina, thank you. So, um, the question then that I'm faced with is, what the baseline is telling me is there's a particular ordering I can write these in that will be particularly or specifically very useful for us, right? So specifically, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this out just in general. I'm gonna say this equals the probability of S times the probability of, uh, I wanna say, uh, let's say T given S, times the probability of J, I'm sorry, not J, given T and S, times the probability of L given not J, um, T and S. Right, so I just, I just took this and decomposed like I always do. A, B given A, C given A and B, and D given A, B and C. Now, what the BayesNet says is that when I write the statement out, all I have to do is condition on the parents. So, for S, it has no parents, so S, I can just say probability of S. Oh, and I already have the probability of S, great. For, oh, I wrote T. Okay, I want, actually, I, should, I wanted to write it in this order, but that's okay. So, I'm, one second. I want to write in the order that make, makes this clearer. So, probability of S. Probability of J, 
Um, given S. Do I pick A? And then, so I know the probability of A times the probability of B given A, and the probability of C given A and B, and I work my way all the way down. So this this is just, this, this is just gen, this ignore that this is just the definite def, uh, uh, equality comes from from probability theory. Okay, and remember I can write this in any I can write I can write probability of R times the probability of J given R. And I can I can mix them up however I want, but essentially this is these are all equivalent statements. And we're always given the probabilities within each of these nodes. Right? Yes. So the computation of the actual Bayes net and the probabilities in each one of the nodes would be something that the, an algorithm would give you back. Or you would construct by hand, which is something that I expect you guys to do in practice. Um, I say that, I added that part to the slides because what is sometimes common is if you use a Bayesian network in real life, an expert may be able to say, I also want to encode some things that may not be in the data or that I think is very important, right? So you might want to encode this is a thing, but also the prop, if, if the name is Muhammad, do something different, right? You might want to encode that information in there so it doesn't come out and seem like you're being racist. So the by hand thing is just so you understand that it's not completely automatic. It can, you can write things down, but I'm not going, that's something that is not something that I necessarily will test you on because that's sort of an independent thing on its own when you want to do that. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you end up with, this is this, this statement here, being able to be decomposed like this and again, one of many other ways to decompose it, because for any of like combination, I can decompose it in whatever order I want. This is a, comes from probability theory. The Bayes net says specifically, though, that because of the structure, I can actually be smarter than this. Because, for example, if I want to know the probability of L given S and, and S and J, right? If I want to know this thing right here, I need to know probability of let's again, let's say this was. Let's say this L was, uh, you know, rate, uh, pay given race and gender. I have to know probability. I have to know basically. I have a table that basically says you got, you know, high pay or low pay given black. Let's say given uh, person of color and not person of color. Um, I need and I, but I have to have it multiple ways. I have that person of color and not person of color, and then also combine on J, which is going to be gender. So I'd have person of color and, um, uh, let's see, and uh, male, person of color and uh, not male. I have to have the combination of uh, not person of color and female and, um, let's see, person of color, person of color, male, not male, person of color, not person of color, female, essentially male here, not person of color, male here. And so always every combination of these two variables that we have to exhaustively list it out for high pay and low pay. So I have a big table to explain basically what the probabilities are. I have to calculate each one of those probabilities, right? But what this is saying is that for S, in order to compute this, for S, this condition on its parents, which is nothing. So S by itself, that's good. J, condition on its parents. It has no parents, so I don't have to condition on S anymore. I can just ignore that. I can just compute the probability of J. I don't think you probability of J given S anymore, which means that instead of having to compute S and not S for you know J and not J, instead of computing this two by this this table here, I can just compute J and not J. So I I, I cut my my I cut my number parameters estimate in half. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it went from that to the for T only on its parent. So get rid of S, J, and R, and just have L. So now instead of estimating for each one of these, I need a really big matrix of combinations of the parents. Um, and you can see kind of what a matrix of parents looks like. If you look at, if you look at slide um, uh, 32, based on the inference one we're talking about, right? There is that um, table there for each one of those nodes. And so it's saying that's what I. That's the only set of parent values I need to look at. These are the ones I have to look at, not the other ones. And so I've reduced essentially my set of things to estimate by saying these conditionings, I, I can ignore them, right? I don't condition on S and, and L, I don't condition on S and J and R here, I condition only on the parent. And so that's that's really the, the benefit of Bayesian instead of conditioning on all the other things, 
Instead of saying everything's dependent on everything else, I can say some things are essentially conditionally dependent, given the parents. Does that make sense? That is what, so again, maybe now if you go back and review that video you, you said you wrote, that's essentially what I'm saying, but I did it a bit more, um, a sort of like, a, like telegraph, like kind of thought about how I wanted to structure and kind of walk through it. So I think, and I had like a, the slides prepared, so hopefully that will make it a little bit clearer if you look at that video again. I think it's like 10 minutes, so it shouldn't be that bad. Um, so, so, so think about this is just a smart, it's telling me I can represent this joint probability in whatever sequence I want. The Bayes net tells me a particularly smart way to represent it because I can just write this as, get rid of that S because I don't need it. Leave that one there, get rid of S and L because I don't need them. Get rid of S, J, and R. So, S, J, and R, leave that one. So instead of the original one where I look at everything given everything I've observed before, so A and then B and then C, but given A and B because I've observed them before, I only have to condition the ones that are there before and are their parents. And so in this case, I was, I'm was i being smart about what I have to estimate. Okay. Okay. And so how does that relate to anomaly detection? So remember that we're talking about anomaly detection. If I gave you this thing right here, this, this is the... Let's say the number of sessions in a day, so the mean was, you know, two, uh, the variance was, you know, 0 0.01. And I said, I found somebody who, who number of sessions in the day was 25. The probability of seeing that would be very small, right? You would say that was a p-value very, very small. And that to me seems like something in the tail, therefore an anomaly. Right, mm -hmm. And so the idea here is that once I have a model, this is a model too, it's just, it's a graph representation of what matters and doesn't matter, but like it's still a model, which I can ask, what is the probability of observing my thing? What is the probability of observing what I observed? Right? And it gives me probability out saying it's, you know, equal, this equals 0 0.0001. Then that to me is unlikely and therefore potentially, uh, and therefore an outlier potentially an anomaly. So you can think about anytime you have a model, mm -hmm. a probabilistic model, be it a parametric distribution or a Bayesian network or what have you, you can perform inference on it. That is to ask it probability statements. And if you have a particular event and you say, what's the probability of observing this event? It's really tiny. And it's, and it's probability is very small. Yeah. That means it's something in the tail and therefore something you should probably look at. Okay. Okay? Yep. We're trying to we're giving ourselves like an upper bound and trying to figure mm. out how many outliers. Wait. What topic is this for again? Uh, GESD. GESD. GESD, yeah. Mm -hmm. so this is the advanced topics in anomaly detection. This is the first part of that slide. The lecture. Okay. So we're testing our number of times for up to our outliers. So the idea is that you have a sequence of values. You have a set of values. And you want to you want to see if there's any outliers. Um, and so the way it works is that you give it a upper bound on how many outliers you you're gonna you're gonna say may exist. So um, you can think about saying, listen, I don't believe that more than ten percent of my data is an outlier. I, don't, I think no more. That's like my sort of like standardized assumption or something like that. If if I have 25% of my data being outliers and something's wrong, it's not outliers, these are actually things I should, that are part of my actual data distribution. Something like that, so you say 10%, which corresponds to a certain fixed number, right? If you, if you have if you have 1,000 data points, 10% is 100, right? And so then what it's gonna do is basically going to test um, and see, essentially, um, if you, is gonna test for one outlier, two outliers, three outliers, four outliers, all the way up to essentially 100 outliers. And it's going to sort of say which particular test of one, of two, of three, of four, of five, or seven, or whatever, which test is basically, which one of those tests rejects the null that there are no outliers the most? Because the null hypothesis is that there are no outliers. The alternative is that there is either one, or two, or three, or four, or 
up to 100. One of those is true. And so it's going to find out basically which alternative rejects the null the most. Okay. Right? Because remember how we do testing? We say we have a test of the, right? We say like, if the null is true, let's say we're testing, let's go back to the stats. We're mm -hmm. testing a T test for difference in means, right? So we say we believe that, you know, the mean of this sample it equals mu versus not, you know, equals zero versus not equals zero. We test and see how far away from the distribution it is, how far far it is. And so we could say basically which particular test is the most extreme, which particular test gives me the most the smallest p value that is the most unlike my assum assumed null. It's kind of like regression testing then, right? Where where it shows uh, a adjusted r and a p so value. R and r squared. Yeah. So so r and r squared is basically saying above the baseline, how much more variance am I explaining? Yep. Um, but but it also provides a p value, and then you use so that to those p values are usually for the different betas yep. in your regression. Yeah. Right, and so yes, but slightly different because these this is testing for one, or two, or three, or four, sort of, and that's testing if this particular slope is not zero, or this particular slope is not zero. They don't, in some sense, affect each other. Whereas if I have one outlier, right, then like that affects my probability of having two outliers, right? Because they're essentially like um, subject to each other, right? substance of, of each other so that in some sense that it's sort of a different but like you are doing the same kind of idea like these multiple tests that you mm -hmm. want to figure out which one is the most extreme okay um, is that an equation that we'll have to know too so 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 I, so I, so I can't obviously go through everything and say this equation you'll have to know or not um again i i i would the way i would structure this is in the equation that you think would be particularly useful for you, I would write it down. I mean, that's the reason I give you the cheat sheet is to sort of relieve that burden of memorizing equations. So, um, you know, I took stat exams throughout my entire PhD and we had, I, I, there had to be hundreds, maybe even more equations that were relatively useful and related, right? Some of them like those ones that are on the board, like you just memorized because you've done it a thousand times. Some of them are like crazy. You've always hit this one part and so, I adopted this strategy of the, of the cheat sheet just so you can relieve that stress. So any equation you think is particularly useful or maybe something that um, you know you couldn't re-derive or understand, write it out. Now what I will say is that for GESD, um, the equation of the statistic and the equ the equation of the statistic is pretty straightforward. The equation of the rejection is that lambda is pretty crazy, and I didn't even go through it for you guys in the exam in the class. So no, you will not have to know the rejection critical region for uh, like what lambda equals. Um, and LOF, I yes. had. Um, I think Sandy had a question about this. Yeah, she did. So I'll segue to hers as well. So um, just having a good understanding of it, what I had written down was find some measure of local density for every point. Mm -hmm. Take the densities of k neighbors, nearest neighbors. Mm -hmm. Further your density, the less dense you are, and that gives. So the last thing uh, further your density the less dense you are, or further your, your distance, I guess. From right. your neighbors. Yeah. Yes. And then gives it gives a numerical measure of how anomalous you are. Yes. Okay. So, so and then if your density is much right. less, if your density is much less than your close, closest neighbor's density, then you are anomalous. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's enough to have that, a basic that, understanding. That, that, that intuition for what it does is precisely spot on. Cool. And then what Sandy was asking, was she wanted an explanation of how the math works? Yeah, so I guess I don't understand what she meant by how the math works. Um, so on one of the slides, it says local outlier factor of A, and then it has like a bunch of equation stuff. Um, I don't know which slide that's from. I think she actually might have posted the slide. Yeah, she had it on, on the email, if you want to take a look at that. Um, but...
Yes, no, there it is. Yeah, okay, okay, so by the math works, it is, she's, she wants an explanation of what the, what each element in the equation captures. So, so like, you, you look, you're right, so I mean, so, okay, so to me it seems really self-explanatory, so, so I guess I'm, I'm confused on exactly what the confusion is, so I'll just walk through yeah. it, and then, um, I don't know if you talked to her, so you had a sense of, okay, so. No, so I was driving when she emailed us. Okay, so, um. So, so there's this key, there's a one above it which explains what the local reachability density is, and it's essentially um, the way to think about it is you have the distance an element is to all of its closest neighbors, right? So the new, the denominator of LRD is essentially the average distance to your neighbors, right? So your point of the distance from me to you. Distance from me to Christina, mm -hmm. you're my nearest neighbor, so the average distance from me to, to you guys. Yep. Right? That's, in that some sense, tells you how far away we are. Remember that distance and density are inverses of each other. Mm -hmm. That is, if there is a small amount of distance between me and my friends, more dense. I am more dense. Right? And so that's why this is not just, the, it's, it's one over the distance. Right? So this, if I, if one, over, one over the average distance. So if my average distance from me to my, my neighbors is growing, right, then my density is getting smaller. That's why it's one over. Okay. Right, so one, one over one, one over two, one over three, like my denominator is getting smaller, I mean getting larger, four, five, six. The one over that value is getting strength, it's strength while going to zero, so it's getting smaller. So as, my, as I get further and further away, my distance to you guys gets further away, my density is shrinking. Okay. Okay? And so that's just a measure of that. And then we use that to basically say, let me look at the ratio, the numerator of LOF is essentially the um, ratio of me, of my, uh, the ratio of, I'm sorry, of my friends, of my neighbor's density. So like how close you are to your friends, mm -hmm. how close you are to your friends, or right, so the density of you and your friends, density of you and your friends, and mine, and saying basically, if you are very close to your friends, and you are very close to your friends, and you guys are my friends, but I'm very far away from you, then then that, that means that there's a difference between me and you, right? So if you have a lot of close friends, a lot of close friends, and I have no friends at all, or you're my closest friends and you're my student, so therefore I got no friends at all, I, socially, you're I, an anomalous. You know, yeah, I'm anomalous, right? And so the numerator is just that, yeah. weighting my, me to you guys, and then dividing by, again, how many friends I have. So that's the average. So it's basically averaging the ratio of how dense you guys' groups are and how dense my group is, which includes you guys. Yep. And then speaking of which, um, are you going to test us on the difference between anomaly and outlier? Because you used those, you like explained it a little bit, but then you used them so, synonymously. So, so what I said is that I gave you my intuition for how I think about them differently. Yeah. Right? Um, I said that they are commonly used in literature synonymously. Um they, to me, the difference is that an outlier is simply just a consequence of the system behaving naturally. In a normal distribution, I will still get things that are in the tail just by random chance. Yeah. Where an outlier is actually a different mechanism, a different thing has happened. There has been a, I, I use the example of every now and then you'll get a Wednesday where you have a spike in people coming to the store. Right. But if that happens to happen, but that happens three Wednesdays in a row because someone has to sell on pizza next door, the latter one is an anomaly. The original one, the, the first time that wasn't going to do with anything else was an outlier. Yep. And so that's in, that, that distinguishes is important to the extent that we get to anomalous pattern detection because I think you can't really make a case for an anomaly in the way I think about it unless you have a pattern versus not. Okay, so if you saw a pattern of outliers, then you can assume that there's something else generating the outliers. I would, I would again, you, saying you can assume it is, is, is kind of, you know, statistically sort of loose. What I would sure. say is that you may have more evidence yeah. for this pattern of uh, these anomalies as a function of some new mechanism. Okay, It's more evidence, more so than you can say it is, certainly or not. So I use anomaly and outlier detection synonymously, or as synonyms in the first lecture, simply because it is common. But I gave you my sort of, my maybe subtle di differentiation between them, but that is really relevant for anomalous pattern detection because that, again, assumes this new mechanism that you're trying to uncover. Mm -hmm. Um, so to ask you to differentiate between um, this idea of an anomaly and anomalous pattern detection 
um, and an outlier seems perfectly reasonable for me um, because we dedicated a whole lecture to anomalous pattern detection. In okay. Sense. Okay. Um, That's good to know. Yep. Yep. Um, wrap it up. Okay. Yep. Uh, let's see. Okay, so PCA, what are the properties yes. of the algorithm? So what I have is we find the first component that the ma that maximizes the variation. Yes. So that's like you have your blob. Yep. And then you figure out where to draw your line yep. that would maximize variation, right? Yep. Um, and then you draw another line like that would do a 90 degree yeah, angle. Yeah, so, it has, so it has to be orthogonal or let's, orth say, let's say perpendicular. That's an, that's sure. Term, perpendicular. Yep. Um, and is the next perpendicular line that will maximize the variance yep. or minimize reconstruction error. You should know that those two things are equivalent statements. Okay. So I, I have the slides in my eyes. Basically, basically, you can think about either minimizing reconstruction error or maximizing variance. Either okay. one of those are um, are the same. Okay. Um, and I don't, I don't uh, understand where you say the new lines can't have a correlation. I don't understand the correlation piece of it. Because they're perpendicular. So so think about so if I have two if I have if I have this line and I have so let me let me let me think about this. Think about this. Okay. So Is that helpful to ask? That means they're correlated. So, so correlation is saying that to correlation specifically is a linear correlation. As I say, as I increase one thing, the other one increases. Mm -hmm. So, if I had the line, if I had the values x and y, and if basically, you know, if I have points that basically look like that, they are correlated because as I increase x, I also increase y. Those are positively correlated, right? Yep. If my points basically um, look like this, those are uncorrelated. Mm -hmm. As I increase x, y can be anything, mm -hmm. right? So what I'm saying is that so when you have points that are essentially, if you have when you have vectors that lie like this that are orthogonal, right? They're perpendicular. That means that essentially they're uncorrelated. They don't have any um, relation between each other, and so originally we had we drew it x y. We had these points. You can draw one. And, and x and y correlate with each other right now. Yep. If I use if I make my dimension actually this, right, and then I make it that. But if I put now I put them now let's rotate x y this way. Yep. You get x y. The points basically they just look like. Yep. Like that. Which gets back to the point I made before where they're uncorrelated now. Yep. Right? As that X makes moves, sense. Y essentially. So then you don't need Y anymore. Right. So the idea is that if, if my graph looks like this, then really all I need is X. Y, y tells me very little of my information. So I can reduce my dimensions in half and still get most of the variation I need in my actual, uh, in my actual, uh, My actual uh, data, sorry, the brain freeze there. Um, things you also want to be thinking about um, are things like, um, you know, how are we capturing the principal components, right? So what's the way to think about that? You, you again, you, you can say either, you can think about either drawing a line, drawing a new line, or think about it as rotating and then projecting it into a lower space, mm -hmm. right? Because like you said, if I, if I said basically, I'm going to, if I, I take my graph, I can rotate them into X and Y, we can say this, and then I can just say basically project all my points down to their x coordinates and get rid of y, right? And now I just have that. So I project. I took my points from this two-dimensional space. I rotated my axes, Put them in, and then I projected my points just down into x space, and that's it. So I lost the dimension, yep. but I kept as much variance as I possibly could, or minimized reconstruction error as much as I possibly could. So we, you can think about it as a um, a low dimensional approximation of my original data set with certain properties like the dimensions are orthogonal um they minimize reconstruction error or maximize variance things like that and is the principal component the same thing as the eigenvector so 
I will not ask you to understand anything about eigenvectors and eigenvalues. I think that they are very important concepts in linear algebra more broadly, and this is a linear algebra technique, um, but I did not teach you those things. The text is that you get guarantees from statistics, right? You know, you know, uh, yeah. give, 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 pick, pick which one of these is the best, um, a best benefit of, of, of graphical based knowledge section, right? Um, shock options are, you know, you can draw it, you, know, you, you can see it visually and your eyes are better than everything else. Yep. Um, um, you know, and pick three of the things that could have given you the options, right? Like, it's like that kind of thing where okay. you should be able to hopefully derive understanding from the question and it, it should be. Cool. And then given that, like, with model-based benefits, yes. is it that they're simple and intuitive and statistically speaking, it gives you guarantees? So model-based ones? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. I got that one. And then let's see. Oh, what are – okay, uh, distance-based benefits and distance-based challenges. So think about the benefits the, and challenges of, of clustering, and those are the distance. And, and, and because clustering basically is a okay. procedure for using distances. And so all the benefits – Essentially, all the benefits and all the challenges port over to this. Got it. So one is uh, deciding which K to use. Section. Excuse me? Deci deciding which K to use. Perfectly That's good, a challenge. Perfectly good okay. challenge, right? Okay. And depending on which K you use for, let's say, a K nearest neighbor type one, things will be some things will be anomalous things. Well, I went over in class actually talking about, you know, if I make K equals a one versus two versus three, how the different um, density-based methods would change and kind of how that changes things. Um, so yeah, I mean, th those are all the things that you should, I mean, you should be readily able to sort of draw upon. Cool. Um, okay. I, I still have a lot of work to do on, uh, okay. just ba Bayes networks, but, okay. but so, that's, so, so I, what, I, what I would that. say is, um, and we'll stop it here yep. and then, um, you go ahead and review Bayes nets again.